episode 398, The 5 Biggest Mistakes Coffee Shops Make. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio, and I'm your host for the show. I'm so glad to have you along today. Thank you for choosing to spend time here on the show. And those of you who are new, one of the best things that you can do is to subscribe to Keys to the Shop so you're always updated. And those of you who have been listening for a long time, I, you know, you're probably subscribed, but there might be a chance that you're not. So just double check and hit subscribe. You'll always be updated with new content comes out. There is quite a bit coming out and great episodes in the works as we speak. So again, hit subscribe and share these episodes with your friends and family and coworkers, etc. All it takes is a few click of the buttons and you get to share keys to the shop and all of the great content with those who are connected with you on your social media accounts, etc. Really helps the show grow. And thanks so much to everybody who has already done that. Now, Keys to the Shop Consulting is more than just a podcast. It's also a consulting and coaching company that works one-on-one with coffee shop owners and leaders like yourself to help you run a really amazing coffee operation and really to give you clarity, sustainable solutions, and the freedom you need to grow your business and even find joy in the process of doing so. And like I said, that happens through one-on-one coaching and consultation, whether that's on-site or remote. There's a lot of ways that we can work together, and I would love to talk with you about that. All you need to do is reach out chris at keystotheshop.com. That's the email to set up a free discovery call with me to talk all about what is going on with your business, whether you're just starting out and you're just wanting to have a great foundation laid for the future, or you want to level up what you currently have or find some solutions for issues that you're having and the growing pains of your business. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. So go ahead and set up that free discovery call with Keys to the Shop Consulting by emailing chris at keystotheshop.com. Now, speaking of taking things to the next level, one of the reasons why we have such great coffee today is because the technology that we use has gotten better and better. We have more control over the kind of coffee that we serve our customers. And with batch brewing, that is absolutely true with the ground control Cyclops Brewer from Voga Coffee. The ground control uses SCA award-winning technology to give you control over an incredible range of flavors and extraction possibilities that previously, you know, other traditional batch brewers just could not give you. And that really changes the game for quality expectations from batch brew coffee. But not only is this an amazing batch brewer, it also makes tea, batch diced lattes, batch cold brew. So there's a lot of efficiency and profitability potential with this machine. So I would go visit groundcontrol.coffee to learn more today. Really, if you're looking to differentiate yourself, really give your customer a true picture of what your coffee can be and give yourself an opportunity for more profitability and efficiency in the process. And I think you should be using a ground control Cyclops brewer. Go visit them again over at groundcontrol.coffee. Day in and day out, one of the things that you know about customers and you know about baristas is they know when things change. They have a fine-tuned sense for if their drink, you know, quote-unquote their drink or their equipment is different in some way because that's what we do is our world, right? And when we're talking about ingredients and plant-based beverages, because there's so many different options out there, sometimes coffee shops will cycle between lots of different kinds, but consistency is always appreciated. Now it's especially appreciated when it happens to not only be consistent, but the highest quality. And that is absolutely true for the Barista Series from Pacific. The Barista Series was created for baristas and tested by amazing world-class baristas before any of the products hit the shelves. And it stands up to the heat from steaming. It has amazing silky texture for latte art. The Barista Series also keeps the balance of the beverage focused on the coffee. So it tastes harmonious, texture is all there. The presentation is there. It's the whole package. So go to pacificfoodservice.com to find out more information and get samples in your store. I really want you to try this for yourself. I think you'll be convinced, especially then, that the right choice for your plant-based beverages is the Barista Series from Pacific. 
Okay, everybody. Well, today I wanted to talk to you about five big mistakes, some of the biggest mistakes that coffee shops make. Now, you know as well as I do that possibilities for mistakes are always there and innumerable. You know, it's like how many different ways can we mess up a puck of espresso and then the water will just exploit that incongruity. That's business. It's like a puck of coffee. There is always going to be some kind of an imbalance, some kind of a thing that we can do better just a little bit. But then there's really egregious things. There's things that really are huge mistakes that businesses make that I think if we just knew that there was always this potential, then we could just avoid them. And we could take the 30,000 foot view of our business and see, have we been living in this mistake for a long time? And then zoom back in and figure out, okay, what are the things that led to this? Give yourself patience and grace and time and start to, I don't want to say dig yourself out, but, you know, basically build yourself out. So if you're in the hole, you need to kind of like build yourself up and out of that hole. And it takes some time. So I wanted to cover these because I think that I see them in both large and small ways in coffee shops all over the place. And maybe you don't have these five things happening in your shop, but there might be the seeds of these things. There might be the beginnings that you can stop from growing, which is even better. I mean, that's really why this show and my consulting and any of us who are worth our salt in teaching and coffee do what we do is because we want you to have a better, higher level to start from. And, you know, that is what pushes the industry forward. If you can avoid some of these mistakes, don't worry about developing wisdom through, you know, failing fast and often and all that stuff. You'll find new ways to fail. That's the goal, right? <laughs> don't find old ways to fail. Find new ways to fail. So let's talk about these five biggest mistakes coffee shops make. And the first one is kind of a hyphenated or is a two-parter. Comparison and isolation. So the first thing that I think coffee shops do that's a big mistake is comparison. This is an alarm that I ring on the show all the time about comparison. And there's that quote about comparison is the thief of joy. And there's also just episodes on the show that talk about the comparison trap, I think, and other things like that. You are not your competition, or shift break called You Are Not Your Competition. And you'll find these in the show notes as well. Links, of course, always listen to the recommended episodes after you listen to an episode because that'll, you know, that's all designed to help you go further into learning these concepts. But comparison is probably one of the most notorious killers of motivation, while at the same time, you know, our access to examples is inspiring. It is also distracting. And I think there is a kind of a stair step between inspiration and comparison. In that middle point is distraction. And then it is kind of dejection. And then we get to comparison. You know, so it's not a perfect analogy, but you see, we kind of start off looking and being like, man, I wish my coffee shop could be like that. Or I was on vacation and I you know, saw all these cafes and it was inspiring. And then you start to get a little bit more distracted by all the other coffee shops and the bits and pieces and flashy things and what they're doing on their menu. And all along the way, what happens is you start to kind of lose your identity. And because there's no root in yourself, in you don't have this organizational self-awareness and knowledge, you're not building that foundation, really. You're just kind of collecting things, but it's not substantive. There's not a lot of values at the core of what's happening. It's the way I'm talking about comparison now is that we take all of the available examples of coffee shops and we create this kind of a vision board version of a coffee shop. And that can easily go from inspiration to comparison, where we start to really feel bad about what we've created because it's not exactly like the thing that inspired us. That's when inspiration starts to take 
an ugly turn. You know, something toxic is always something good that turns a different way. You know, like milk turning bad after its expiration date. I don't know if you've had the pleasure of steaming milk that's gone bad, but you know, hopefully you catch it before you serve it to the customer. All the clumps, you know, splashing down into the coffee <laughs> from the pitcher kind of are a clue that what was good is now a liability. What was good has turned toxic. And I hate to see it when people get in this comparison game with coffee shops and other businesses that are really meant to inspire them. And the difference between something being inspirational and then having it turn toxic into this kind of comparison trap is that you learn to just take the inspiration and allow it to grow something in you, but don't let it be the thing that gives you life. Your inspirations are not the things that end up having to give you life. You have to give yourself life. You have to become autonomous. And that's what I mean by having a root in yourself. You can't live off the fumes of somebody else. And so the comparison thing is hard because we've got Instagram, we've got websites and all sorts of things that we can make ourselves feel bad about. And we just did a shift break about this, loving where you are and how the embracing of your current situation and becoming a student of where you are currently and who you're with and what you're doing and who you're doing it for and why you're doing it, this is what creates the future that really is going to satisfy your soul. And ultimately, these are the kind of shops that not only are really fun to run and own, but they're also fun to be in, and work in, to be a customer in. So comparison is a big mistake, I think. Compare yourself against where you were. Compare yourself against yourself. That toxic way of comparing yourself, so it kind of creates this demotivation. This is a big mistake. And I'd hate to see you not get the kind of energy you could be getting because you're wasting your time always comparing yourself against other industry people. Bring it in a little bit, okay? So that brings us to what I think might be the other side of the same coin. Number two, the five biggest mistakes that coffee shops make is isolation. So you could go a little too far here and completely isolate yourself as a business and not pay any attention to what's going on in the industry at all. You are just refusing to get anything new, hear of anything new. As far as you're concerned, what you have is the only thing that exists. There's no new techniques. You know, we've been making coffee this way for 20 years and we're not going to change. I mean, no, no exact reason why. It's usually because we've been making coffee this way for 20 years. We've been using this roaster for this long and we don't want to change. You know, there's all sorts of ways that when we close ourselves off to the outside industry, we close ourselves off to possibilities. And one of the big things that you could actually be depriving yourself of is not only you know, better equipment or maybe better ways to make coffee and that kind of stuff, but solutions for your business. You know, just by listening to a podcast, you're allowing outside ideas to influence what you do. Now, you can be a student of where you are. I think that's great. Of course, I talk about it a lot. And I think that's one of the primary things you need to do. But you also need to, as a good student, realize you don't know what you don't know. And the curiosity that you have to bring to the table in order to create something great leads you to seeking outside help, outside perspectives. Your peers in the industry do have things to potentially help you with what you're doing. Take it with a grain of salt, translate it to your situation. You don't always have to apply what you hear. Neither do you always have to reject that which comes from the outside. Ooh, the outside, you know. And a lot of legacy coffee shops are kind of withering away because of this. Now, that's not always the case. And there are plenty of shops who simply are doing great the way they are and more power to them. I think that, you know, for every rule or podcast I put out there, there's always going to be an example of be like, well, that's not necessarily the case, Chris. And I am fully aware of that. You know, there's somebody out there who is having a really profitable cafe. They don't listen to podcasts. 
They don't care about new techniques and neither do their customers. And if it's working for you, perfect. It's working for you. But I think the disposition is really what I'm getting after. The idea that if there's an antagonism toward outside influence, I think that eventually will come to haunt you a little bit. So if you're listening to this, well done. You know, not just because you're listening to Keys to the Shop, although that helps, I think. <laughs> but you're, you're thinking there could be things that I need to hear that will help me with what I do in my space for my people, you know, for the reasons I do my business. And I think we need to be open to these things. Again, we don't need to just live off of the fumes of other people. We don't need to go the other extreme that we just talked about with comparison and only trying to become some kind of a shadow of somebody else or mimic and all that. Neither do we need to go the other complete opposite direction and isolate ourselves and do the whole, you know, M. Night Shyamalan's The Village treatment on our coffee bar. So let's now go on to number three here, the five biggest mistakes coffee shops make, and that is under-resourcing the most important things. And what are the most important things? Now, if I just kind of left the space, you might fill it in for me and I say, well, the number one most important thing in your coffee shop is what? That's right, the people. If you said the people, you win a free podcast. <laughs> but yeah, it is the people and all of the things that impact the people. So starting with your staff and your customers, of course, this is the two groups of people that you are directly responsible for. And resourcing your staff begins with paying them what you can, not just what you can get away with. That is a paradigm shifting way to view it. You know, if you just change the way that you approach it to say, what can we pay them? And then be upfront about that and clear and consistent and fair. That is a great way to start resourcing your staff. Clarity in their schedules so that you're always communicating and you give them a predictable work environment where they can plan their lives around work. And instead of constantly just be feeling like they're on call at every given second, that might be the world that you have as an owner. And maybe even if you're listening to this, you might be an upper manager or something. That's kind of the thing that you sign up for. You're on call. And the higher compensation is usually one of the reasons why you do that. But the point is, is that baristas, one of the love languages that you can speak is giving them a schedule that is predictable as possible, as clear as possible, and is operating with respect to the kind of availability that they've given you. And there's a lot of antagonism that owners have over baristas and their schedules for a myriad reasons. But the point is, is that that's one of the ways that you can help resource your staff on top of giving them clarity of process and expectations, detailed expectations and process. We're talking about recipes, SOPs, checklists, and the like, so that they can actually do their job well, the one that you want them to do, and not feel like they're being put up to a task that they're being set up to fail at. And the tools, of course, are one of the things that your staff need. I was working in a coffee bar where, you know, there was a shake and drink and there's lots of orders for this shake and drink. And guess what? On these days where you're you know, doing a lot of these drinks, there's only one shaker. And yes, there was a request. Can we get another shaker? Okay, let's look into that. I mean, not much to look into. And I know you've been there, baristas out there listening, where you've actually used your own money to go out to a restaurant store and just make it happen. And on the show, we've talked about this, the resourcefulness of these baristas and being decisive in these situations is often applauded, but it's actually the indictment against us not resourcing them. So that's one of the biggest things that we don't resource and pay attention to in the shop is our staff. And not only that, but communication. Communication is so key and doing so consistently, having a system for it so that it's not just left up to chance. And if I see them, I'll tell them. But if I don't see them, I guess they're not being told. We need to be more organized to be able to facilitate people's success in a meaningful, planned out way. Because we can use the words, I just want to facilitate their success. And I just want to like, you know, do this platitude and that platitude. But unless it's a real plan, 
and a real process, it's just not going to happen. And so that is one of the areas. Now, for your customers, of course, this means that you're operating with respect to what their expectations are. And when you properly resource your customers, you keep them in the loop of what's happening in the shop. You just don't do things suddenly without respect to what the impact is going to be to your customers. You do as much as you can for them. And as much as it depends on you, keep them in the loop because you've developed this relationship where they expect you to be open at a time that you say you're going to be open. They expect you to have a menu item that's on your menu. So if you don't have a good inventory system, an ordering system, or, you know, it's kind of spotty, what's going to happen down the line is your customers are going to feel like you don't really care. And that's a really big deal. It's kind of insulting to the customer. You've told them that you have this. They take time out of their life to come into your shop and yeah, mistakes happen, but let's be honest. How many times are mistakes going to happen before we create a solution to mitigate them from happening again? Like I said in the beginning, don't fail in old ways, fail in new ways. That goes for your own business too. So once mistakes happen, use those mistakes to create solutions so they don't happen again. That's a way that you resource your customers well, and you get feedback from them and from your staff. So these two groups of people, the staff and the customers, are ultimately the number one thing that you need to be resourcing. And a lot of shops just bank on an aesthetic. They bank on the quality of their coffee, and that's fine. But the way you treat people and the way you set up the system to support the whole experience in its consistency and its excellence, of course, but, you know, doing it for those groups of people, that is what really makes a difference between a shop that's loved and a shop that's tolerated. And there's a lot of shops out there that are quote unquote successful, but really they're just tolerated. And you know why I know that? Because when a really great shop comes into town, everyone goes there because they can feel something is a little different. And let's not that, and let's not have that be our shop. So the most important things are people and resourcing them well. And I want to throw in here also, caring for the experience of these people means that the money that you spend in the shop, if you have your choice between, you know, getting really fancy line t-shirts that costs a little bit more, you just love them so much, you know, like it's a little bit more money for these, but I think they're super cool. But you know, that something is broken on the bar and that money could go to fix that and it has a direct impact on the quality of life of your staff, you have a choice to make. This is the burning question. What are you going to do with that money? And do you have the presence of mind to even have that conversation with yourself? Are you being responsible with the resources allocated to different parts of the business? You know that you're taking care of first things first and not just you know, spending money in lots of different novel ways, but not in the areas that are the most important. So I just want to add that there as well. Now, number four on our list of five biggest mistakes that coffee shops make is failing to evolve systematically. We hinted at this here. We're talking about don't make the same mistakes year after year. Build a system. Build a system so that you can create opportunities for better workflow, more clear communication during catering events, more consistent beverages, cleaner coffee shops. One of the reasons why we don't do this is because it's a set it and forget it mentality where we create the system at first. Maybe if we are honest, there's no system, you know, it's just kind of our understanding and it's working. And what we do internally is we're like, oh, good, it's working. Whew, write that off. I'm done. That's I'm not going to go back and, and do anything on this. And it keeps working. And then when it stops working, we don't realize it's it. We start blaming staff. We start blaming the economy. We, you know, all this other stuff. We don't realize that what's happened is we've needed to update our operating systems, just like a computer. The industry will force you to do this year after year. Just your own shop will, not even the industry, but the fact that now your business is twice as busy as it was means that you need to update the software. You need to update things. You need to examine 
the guts of the operation and say, maybe it's not this nefarious reason you're thinking. Maybe it's just that we need to expand and make, be, be more detailed and build some more clear expectations and SOPs and other things like that in the business. Year after year, this would be a great thing for you to do. Examine your operations and see what needs to graduate to a different level. What needs to be refined? Every time I give a client of mine some kind of a template or guidance, it's always with the idea that this is going to be customized for you. And I will be so disappointed if two or three years from now, it's the exact same as it was. Even if you tell me, well, we didn't change it because it works so well. Now I'll be flattered, but not for long, <laughs> you know, because there's no way that I'm that good. There's no way because that wasn't created to be that good. It was created as a starting point. You can't tell me that there isn't something that can be added or subtracted, adjusted. And if we don't create a regular examination of the operations, then what's going to happen is we're going to start to invite dysfunction deep down into the bones of the operation. We're not going to be able to find where it starts. So we have to keep short accounts with these systems and, you know, pay attention to the life cycles of our business and what it needs year after year. And that's how you evolve systematically use systems, examine them, put them in place. And you know what? Use them as well. I can't tell you the number of times I've talked with people and we've got manuals, we've got systems, and it's really a nice warm blanket in the beginning because it's got your logo on it and it's like bullet points. And it's very neat. But if we're not going to use it, then how is it useful? Using something is what makes it useful, right? So as you evolve systematically and you build into your year, these examinations of the operations, you also have to build into your schedule and that schedule of your managers and anybody else who represents the values of the business, who's responsible for not only holding people accountable, but for inspiring people to, you know, grab hold of these things and execute the vision day after day. You know, you've got to build into that schedule time to reinforce what is written. How do we do these things? Why do we do these things? It becomes a mantra. I'm reminded of Dorian Bolden of BU Cafe in Durham, North Carolina, You're talking about how the values and vision are all over the place in his cafe because he wants people to internalize it. That's really key. And you know, when you do create the structures of your business and these systems, you need to make sure they are a part of the life of your business. And when you do that, it's going to be easy to see when they need to change. You're always going to have the light of day shining on them so you can see clearly when there needs to be adjustments. It's when we forget about these things, we just are guessing. We don't, we don't know for sure. So anyway, the fourth thing that coffee shops do that's a big mistake is failing to evolve systematically. And now number five, and it's not because it is the least, maybe it's the most, I would say is passive leadership. Passive leadership. This is not the same as saying what is successful is aggressive leadership. You know, passive leadership is apathy. You know, some people say the opposite of love is not hatred, it's apathy. I tend to agree with them. And for whatever reason, you tend to run into a lot of owners who, while they're very passionate about certain things in the business, they're apathetic about the exact things that they need to be the most passionate about. We talked about resourcing people, and it is also the people. The hardest part about running a coffee shop is the fact that now you have to be a leader of people. And in order to do that, you need to step into some uncomfortable scenarios because for a lot of people, 
They are not used to leadership, at least not in this setting. And it's different. I talk to a lot of people and clients who've had, you know, management experience, maybe they've owned a business before, but the kind of leadership that you do in maybe corporate environments, unless you've worked in food service as a manager or a coffee shop as a manager before, it may translate a little bit, but it's not going to be exact. And almost nothing can prepare you, I think, for your unique business. It's an adventure. You know, you're going to learn a lot just by doing it. No book is really going to 100% prepare you. It's the wisdom you gain from experience. That's something that you can't be passive about. You need to be present in order to learn and to grow as a leader. You need to be engaged with people. That's what vulnerability is about. It's about opening yourself up to mistakes. I'm going to make a mistake. People are going to see me make a mistake. And that's okay. It's fine because you're still the owner. No one's like knocking on your door with lawyers and be like, uh, remember Tuesday when you made a mistake? Well, <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you this, but you're no longer the owner. It's not the way it happens. So passive leadership often is fearful leadership. We're fearful of taking a step into something that's unknown, maybe fearful of looking foolish. Just today, I was telling my son about this. You know, all the people, anyone you can think of who is really great at something used to be the worst at it until they weren't, until they did it, until they failed forward and whatever other, you know, phrase sounds really cliche that we could put in there. But the truth is one of the worst things that can happen to a coffee shop is that leadership just opts out of leadership and decides to focus on the books. And only when they are sufficiently agitated will descend from on high or from the office or wherever or even <laughs> people have done this because they have speaker systems on their camera systems and they'll actually like call in, hey, get to work. <laughs> I think the voice, like a baby monitor. Ooh. I mean, that's the ultimate, for me, dysfunction. Dysfunctional leadership and toxic leadership starts when we start listening to the voice of fear that leads to passivity because people want to be led. They want to know what to do how to do it. How do I win this thing? We don't want somebody who has the ultimate authority to be completely not there and not engaged. I'd rather have somebody who makes a lot of mistakes and is just learning from them and passionately for me and growing in the process and there with me and seeing my mistakes, seeing my successes. At least we all know where we stand than somebody who I only see once in a while and they pretend to know what's going on because they were on a computer. And so passive leadership often, again, is based on fear. And we need to have strong leadership. Strong leadership makes other people strong. It's not aggressive in that we're going to try to just force our will upon the masses. You do have to hold people accountable, but you do so as a servant leader. I'm a big believer in servant leadership. Also a big believer in telling people what to do and how to do it. This is a business and we're also going to receive feedback. We're here to lead and also not pretend we're perfect, but that strong leadership is going to create lots of other leaders. And just like good leadership will create other leaders, bad leadership, passive leadership will create more passivity. It will create dysfunction. And that's how people respond. And again, we will blame, you know, this generation or the economy and all these other things. But this is why isolation is so hard. We isolate as individuals, you know, let alone businesses. Let's talk about us as people. If you as an owner are isolating yourself, you basically cut yourself off from the possibility of having self-awareness. You don't want to hear baristas tell you how you come across because what do they know? Or what does this other coffee shop owner know about? me and my thing. Well, I'll tell you probably more than you think. And anyone who thinks that that's not true, honestly, is fooling themselves. And so I think the biggest thing that we have in coffee shops to fix is our leadership, how we show up. We're either operating out of fear and end up becoming passive and then inevitably becomes toxic. And we pass that on to other people or we show up with strength being vulnerable, but, you know, failing forward and, you know, being on this journey with others and inspiring them 
to push in the exact same way. That example goes a long way to create something beautiful. So these are the top five things, the five biggest mistakes coffee shops make. And I bet you there's five, 10, 15 more things we can talk about. And we've probably you know, talked about them on this show too before. So I hope that this has been helpful for you. And if you've seen a little bit of yourself or your business in what I've been talking about, that is wonderful. Not because it's there, but because you see it. And that is a sign that you can now go take the first step and start addressing the problem. That's the first step to systematically evolve. One step at a time, take one thing a few months and start applying yourself to getting clarity on why it is that this is a problem in your shop or with the way you operate as a leader and then work to fix that. There's lots of episodes on leadership and management and operations on this show that I think will be helpful. Some of those will be in the show notes, and I hope that they will be helpful in you taking the next step. Now, if you have any questions, feedback, or comments for me about today's show, then please go ahead and email chris at keystotheshop.com. That's also where you can reach out for Keys to the Shop Consulting. If you're interested in having any conversations, a one-on-one -on -one coaching with me for your business, go ahead and reach out chris at keystotheshop.com. Now, you know, the great thing about today is that right after this recording, I'm going to be going to Coffee Fest, New York. And Coffee Fest has been going on for 30 years, that it is a trade show for specialty coffee retailers. It's not just a trade show, though. It's like an epicenter of resourcing and equipping people to run great coffee shops. There's free lectures, trainings, workshops, panel discussions, all focused on a range of different topics for your business to truly thrive and for your team to be energized. There's the cold brew competition. There's also the latte art competition. And of course, the trade show floor, you get to interact with amazing vendors of products that will equip your coffee shop for success as well. So go to coffeefest.com for more information. 50% off when you use the code keys, go to coffeefest.com to sign up for the upcoming shows. After this New York one, we've got Louisville, then we've got Anaheim, California, followed by Orlando, Florida. I'll be at all of these shows and I hope you say hello. Again, go check them out over at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show. Thanks a lot, everybody, for joining me. And with that, that is the end of our show, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Don't forget to subscribe to Keys to the Shop. Share these episodes with a friend. Have an amazing day. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.